<laughs> Let's go to our Bible study. Turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew, chapter 1. And we've just started a verse-by-verse -verse study of the Gospel of Matthew. Last week we made some comments and didn't get beyond Matthew 1, verse 4. And uh, we cut off a little earlier than I thought we would. I wasn't sure how long the material would last. And today we may be a little shorter than uh, we normally go. So before we jump in, I thought I'd bring you a couple of things I picked up in my travels this last week. Here's one from a church, such and such United Methodist Church. I won't give the name of them. Uh, and this is a flyer they put out. They have their version of a track rack, you know. Usually it's a table of uh, how women can apply for a WIC and uh, other things along those lines. They'd have nothing concerning the gospel, but it's all about, you know, social justice and there's going to be a rally for this cause or that cause. You know, that's their version of a track rack. And here's one um, with a rainbow flag on the front of it. And uh, you can imagine what that is. Uh, and their slogan, all are welcome. Love is inclusive, not exclusive. And of course, it's all about fags and queers. Um, and this United, you've seen the United Methodist Church logo. And a lot of churches where they, it looks like maybe tongues of fire flames leaping up and it kind of goes up like this. Well, this one, all the different um, tongues of the fire are in rainbow colors. This is how pro-gay this church is. The big banners, uh, rainbow flag banners inside the foyer of the church. The woman minister who was officiating a funeral I worked, she had her robe on. Everybody wants to sort of mimic the Catholic church. All these liberal denominations think we have to wear robes because that's what Catholics wear. They think in order to be religious, you have to wear some special costume. Well, she had her robe on, and right in the front of the robe, there was a rainbow flag in the shape of a cross, right in the front of her robe. Talk about queers, ooh. And so this was a flyer announcing their tolerance. You know, every, they call it tolerance. Um, we, members of such and such United Methodist Church, Strive to draw all people into this loving relationship with God and to be a community which embodies love, reconciliation, justice for all people. What they call tolerance is just simply acceptance. They never thought, stopped to ask, maybe there are some people in the world who really are perverts. And there are. There are some people who are sexual deviants. You can't just say, well, that's his lifestyle, that's her lifestyle. Who am I to judge? Pretty soon you're not criticizing anything in society. And here's another one. I did pick this one up at a Roman Catholic church. Uh, prayer to the Holy Trinity. A little pamphlet. The first prayer, prayer to the Holy Spirit. The second prayer they list, a novena, that's a prayer of nine days or nine steps, to the sacred heart of Jesus. Well, that's not really Jesus. That's like a body part. You know, pray to his heart, pray to the cross, pray to the... So the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, Jesus. And the third prayer, to the immaculate heart of Mary. That's their Trinity. Mary, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's no prayer to God the Father. And Roman Catholics say, we don't worship Mary, we simply honor her. Who's kidding who? I know worship when I see it. How many of you were Roman Catholic before you turned to Jesus Christ? Well, then you know. Let's see here. This is a book called The Private Prayers of Pope John Paul II. I've read to you from this before. They say, we don't worship Mary, we simply honor her. We honor her in a very sp special way. Mm. 
let's see, page, page 147. Just wait for it. It's worth listening to. This was from Pope John Paul II, September 30th, 1981. As you know, tomorrow is the start of the month of October, in particular to a more committed and devout daily recitation of the Holy Rosary. For centuries, this prayer has held an honored place in the worship of the Blessed Virgin. Yeah, I go back to, let's see, page 93 here. Here's one of his prayers from April 14th, 1980. O most holy virgin, may you be the only and everlasting consolation of the church, whom you love and protect. Comfort this people which loves you and worships you. Comfort the many immigrant families, so forth and so on. And I know it's not politically correct. Uh, that's why I'm going to say it. He doesn't mean the immigrant families. He means illegal immigrant families. Because they're all born and bred and raised in the Catholic Church before they come to the United States or whatever country they may migrate to. And not necessarily from Latin America, South America. The Catholic Church is supporting illegal immigration from everywhere to everywhere, trying to disrupt the, the stability of Western societies, Western countries, whether it's France, England, the United States, countries that were, well, not so much France, but England and the United States, countries were, which had a rich history of non-Catholicism, Protestantism, and some Bible influence in those nations. They want to disrupt whatever shred of Bible influence there may be still in this country, by flooding what used to be known as a Protestant nation with Roman Catholics. Um, Hail Mary, with the angel we greet you full of grace. The Lord is with you. We greet you with Elizabeth. We greet you with the words of the gospel. We praise you. We bless you. We worship you, house of the Holy Spirit. You mean they don't worship her? He said they do. At least three pages, Pope John Paul II said they do. When you go to uh, Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> not Matthew, um, make it John, John chapter 5. Let's see. I did the wrong text. Check my own notes back here. Well, the suspense is killing you. The suspense is killing me, too. Yeah, I had the right text. John 5. John 5, notice verse 23. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. When you let the Bible define its own words, you see that honor, by the words of the Lord Jesus, means much more than simply respecting who they were. It means worship, right? So don't let someone say, well, we simply honor her. Yeah, you, you honor her the way Christ said to honor the Father. That is to worship. All right. Now let's get to our lesson, Matthew chapter 1. And we're reading the lineage of Christ. There are a lot of modified spellings in the New Testament compared to the way they're found in the Old Testament. And we're reading the lineage of Christ uh, from Joseph's line. Verse 5, 
and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Obviously, Boaz is Boaz, B-O-A-Z, in the Old Testament, and Rechab is Rahab, the harlot, in the book of Joshua. In the 1700s, there was a man named Adam Clark. He was a well-known Methodist preacher, and he spent 40 years writing a commentary on the entire Bible, which is still consulted by a lot of people today. And his commentary, he said that, tried to argue that harlot simply meant an innkeeper where the men lodged, um, trying to protect Christ's identity, protect Christ's ancestry. And I've heard modern preachers on the radio say that she wasn't really a harlot or prostitute. She was an innkeeper, and so it's a mistranslation in the Bible. But in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 25, when James recounts the story of, of Rahab the harlot in the book of Joshua, the, word, the Greek word he uses for harlot, for, for whatever Greek is worth to you, is P-O-R-N-A, porna. Hence the word pornography and so forth. She certainly was a harlot. Trust the Bible to be, always be telling you the truth. And Matthew knew what he was writing about. And the Bible was correct from the beginning. Verse 6. And Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. The King James Bible is precise when it reads, her that had been the wife of Urias. Notice these words are in italics in your Bible, supplied by the King James translators to hopefully clarify or smooth out the sense. The Revised Standard Version, 1952, reads, of the wife of Urias. But Uriah was dead by the time Solomon was born. Rahab was clearly David's wife now. Uriah was nowhere to be found. He was long since dead. David had him die on the battlefield. Verse 7. And Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa. Again, Roboam is Rehoboam. Uh, Abiah is Abijah, A-B-I-J-A-H, in 2 Chronicles 14. Don't let the spelling changes uh, throw you off. Uh, Rehoboam was the son of Solomon, and he's the son who Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs to. All of those warnings and all those lessons and all of those admonitions to his son in the book of Proverbs were written to Rehoboam. He succeeded King Solomon in the throne. Verse 8, And Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias. Josaphat is recognizable as Jehoshaphat in the list of kings following David. Joram was Jehoram, J-E-H-O-R-A-M, the Old Testament, and Ozias was spelled Uzziah, U-Z-Z-I-A-H, in the Old Testament record. And uh, what we call, what that's called transliteration, where sometimes you have to tweak or change the spelling of a name when you go from one language to another. And I mentioned the example of the name John becomes Juan in Spanish. It becomes Ian in Ireland, Johan in Germany, and Ivan in Russia. And there may be a few other uh, variations of the name John, depending on the language. Verse 8 presents us with a challenge. It reads, Jehoshaphat, then Jehoram, then Uzziah. But in the genealogy in Second Chronicles, the list goes Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, then Ahaziah, Joash, Amaziah, then Uzziah. So there are three 
kings mentioned in the Old Testament that are omitted in the New. So rather than 14 generations um, from David to the carrying away into Babylon, as verse 17 refers to later on, technically the list should have 17 names on it. And this is, of course, posed as some contradiction uh, in the Bible by people who don't believe the Bible. The issue of the three kings not listed here, Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah, began with mixed marriage between the king of Judah, Jehoram, and the king of Israel, or, or Ahab, the king of Israel's daughter, uh, which was a, a false kingdom to start with, the kingdom of Israel. God had never intended it or established it. And I appreciate Dr. Ruckman's commentary because he goes into explanation of why these three were omitted from the list, but for me to try and narrate it to you would be pretty boring, really. <laughs> I might get myself confused, and it would be extremely boring for someone watching online later on. So I'm going to try and draw some charts to help us illustrate these sort of convoluted and twisted family lines uh, for our sake next week. So, But suffice it to say, there are no real contradictions in the Word of God. The bloodline uh, is resumed with Uzziah, so Matthew knew what he was writing about when he wrote. Let me read verses 9, 10, and 11. And Ozias, or Uzziah, begat Joatham, and Joatham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manassas, Manassas begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. There's no break in the genealogy uh, from the Old Testament there in verse 9, and Ezekias, verse 10, that would be King Hezekiah, as you read about in the Chronicles and the list of the kings, the Old Testament. The line of Josiah, or Josias, went like this. It's listed in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. His son, Jehoahaz, takes over the throne after him. Jehoahaz is captured by the king of Egypt, and he's, he deposes him from the throne, and he makes Jehoahaz's brother, Eliakim, king instead. Eliakim's name is then changed to Jehoiakim. Then Jehoiakim is taken to Bab or uh, not Jehoiakim. Um, he's followed by his son, Jehoiakin. Note there's a different spelling on the N, the N rather than the M. Then Jehoiakin is taken to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar when they invaded Judah. And Nebuchadnezzar installs Jehoiakin's brother, Zedekiah, as king in Jerusalem. Jeconias, verse 11, is probably a variant spelling for Jehoiakin. And I'll get to that in a moment. Jehoiakim is also, actually, go back to Jeremiah chapter 22. I'll show it to you. Jeremiah 22. Verse 24. As I live, saith the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, Yet what I plucked thee thence. There, Jehoiakim is referred to as Coniah. So the idea of spellings changing from book to book and from Old Testament to New Testament is just a part of the Word of God. And uh, a careful student spends time trying to put the puzzle pieces together rather than saying, this puzzle is too difficult. And a lot of people, that's the way they view it. But um, so Jehoiakim is also referred to as Coniah in the book of Jeremiah, which now leaves 
the name of Josiah's immediate son, Jehoahaz, out of the list here in verse 11. Last week, we also considered how the word son uh, isn't always a direct son. Sometimes it's a descendant. Here's a good one. A guy who never had children is called the father of our country, George Washington. So the word son is sometimes a descendant, not an immediate son. When it says that Josias begat Jeconias, verse 11, who was really a grandson, it can mean that he begat him indirectly. Go forward to the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. Hebrews 7, and verses 9 and 10. Hebrews 7, verses 9 and 10. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Levi was in the loins of Abraham before Abraham begat Isaac, before Isaac begat Jacob, and before Jacob beget Levi and all of his brothers. So in that sense, he was in the genetic line descending from Abraham before he was ever conceived. Um, and I guess I'm going to summarize or conclude, like I said, I knew we were going to finish early, by saying, let's approach the Bible as Bible believers, not as fault finders. And God willing, I'll have some charts to help illustrate some of these because there's some more later in the chapter. Um, so I'm going to trust that God allows us to do that as visual aids next time.